Oye, belta loda. Anya, inya loda. This video is about some of the medical challenges of settling an exoplanet, as 2020 is hopefully the year the Artemis mission launches, the next step towards humans establishing a base on the Moon and eventually Mars, which is currently slated for about 2035. I'll be using the Expanse TV show as thematic inspiration. Uh, about a year and a half ago when this channel was very tiny, I made a general overview of some of the major problems in space medicine, again using The Expanse as source material. If you haven't seen that video, head on over there first, because that's a kind of introduction to the obstacles of interplanetary travel, as well as a thought experiment into what humans might look like if they grew up in very low gravity environments. It's also spoiler free if you're yet to watch the excellent and scientifically very accurate show. And it even comes with an endorsement from co-creator of The Expanse, the books and the TV show, Daniel Abraham himself, which naturally sent me over the Luna. Season four dropped last month, and it's not only awesome, but full of amazing medicine and biology. The book, Cibola Burn, which a lot of it's based on, has even more, so I couldn't miss this opportunity to explore some more medical concepts with you. I did want to bring you this video sooner, but I'm in PhD lockdown mode, at the moment for the next few months, so the channel's gonna be a little bit quiet, as well as having this pesky day job where I have to go to this big building that's full of sick people, all of which really gets in the way of making YouTube videos, but it is what it is. This is your warning that this video is going to have season four spoilers. So this is what we're going to talk about. Number one, the body adapting when moving from a low to high gravity environment, which is of direct relevance to any mission to Mars, because depending on the relevant apsides, perihelion, aphelion, and other complicated Greek words, i.e. how close Earth and Mars are going to be at the time of launch. Travel time will be around six to nine months, then 18 to 24 months on the surface may be a similar return duration, meaning several years potentially in low gravity. Then we'll talk about surgery in space, infections that might occur on an alien planet, and finally getting spaced, exiting your spaceship without a suit. Okay, we kick off with Naomi Nagata's struggle to acclimatize to gravity uh, that she encounters on the surface of Illus, the first world that is explored outside our solar system. In the books, it's suggested that gravity, G, on the surface of Illus is about the same as Earth, one G. Naomi, a belter who grew up in low gravity, might have quite different biology to what we're familiar with. In the books, she's actually two meters tall, but I'll never object to Dominique Tipper being cast as she's repping East London in space. I explained in that first video why actually I think belters would be shorter than earthers, but let's put that to one side for now and just consider the internal physiology. Oh, sorry, for any Americans, I forgot to convert two meters in height. That's 1.237 times 10 to the 35 Planck lengths. The first settlers on Illus are from Ganymede, which very similarly to our moon, has less than one sixth or so the gravity of Earth. And indeed, we learned that some of them encountered the same problems as Naomi when they arrived. The components of a program to prepare belters for life in higher gravity than they're used to consists of number one, strengthening the bones, number two, increasing muscle strength, number three, improving function of the cardiorespiratory system, the heart and the lungs, and Number four, I presume there is possibly some uh, sort of neurological aspect because balance systems and eyesight are also significantly affected by a lack of gravity. The actual term for all of this is countermeasures, the interventions that astronauts on the International Space Station do to prevent uh, developing all the problems that we assume Naomi will have had since birth. A lack of gravity causes loss of bone density and strength, reduced muscle mass and function, a smaller, weaker heart predisposing to one of the most common and potentially most serious problems, fainting, dehydration, anemia, visual disturbance, and quite a lot more. We see Holden injecting something directly into Naomi's intraosseous space, that hollow space inside bones where you find bone marrow, where many cells, as I'm sure you know, particularly blood cells, are created. However, you can also infuse fluid directly into the body this way. This is something I've only done on two occasions because it's really only an emergency thing where you're not able to get access to a vein, which is much more preferable. And basically you just push a big 
flipping needle through the bone and you can then uh, infuse fluid. It is easier in kids with their puny, weak bones. As I said, a vein is preferable, but Naomi will need volume expansion either way because in low gravity, your blood volume is reduced because blood collects in the middle of the body, fooling the kidneys into thinking you're overloaded with fluid and then the kidneys pee out more fluid. If you stand up on Earth, about 70% of your circulating blood volume will be below the heart, but in microgravity, that isn't the case. Astronauts refer to this volume redistribution as the puffy face bird leg syndrome, which sounds kind of silly and harmless, but the dangers of this were brought home uh, very recently when the fact that astronauts um, have suffered from deep vein thromboses in central large veins was published quite recently. And this is because blood stasis is occurring. It's blood is not flowing back to the heart as normal, as the muscles in the legs and other uh, parts of the body are not working as normal and squeezing the veins and pushing all that blood back to the heart. Now these clots were noted incidentally, meaning they didn't cause any problems, but they have the potential if a blood clot moves and ends up in the lung, for example, to be very serious, potentially even fatal. Naomi's red blood cell count will also be low. She'll be anemic because that misinterpretation of fluid status by the body also means it will produce less blood. So she's likely to receive erythropoietin or EPO to boost her red blood cell count, which acts on the bone marrow directly, even though you don't actually have to inject it straight into the bone marrow. You can just put it in a vein. Just ask any elite cyclist or distance runner. However, the mainstay of bone protection will be bisphosphonate drugs, which reduce the breakdown of bone and um, have been used to prevent osteoporosis for years already here on earth. She might also receive some hormonal supplementation to assist with the sympathetic nervous system changes and the high likelihood of fainting. Resistance exercises like Naomi does absolutely form a key part of bone and muscle countermeasures. The only way to improve her cardiovascular fitness is the exact same way it is on Earth, I'm afraid, exercise. There's no shortcut. Astronauts on the ISS exercise for about two hours a day. There's no way around it, and I don't foresee any drugs being developed that will replace exercise. If they were, they'd surely make their inventor the richest person alive. Space adaptation syndrome, or simply space sickness, is very common, and it includes nausea, vomiting, and just feeling generally lousy and stuffed up. So it's very likely Naomi would suffer an analogous fate. Surgery in space. For this topic, I called up Eleanor Frost, who is an expert in space surgery that I'll hopefully be featuring in future videos along with some of her colleagues, um, to ask about the problems uh, associated with surgery in space. Now, the pooling of the blood here is correct. Blood from your veins, which comes out at a lower pressure, will indeed form a dome like this due to surface tension and the lack of gravity, but arterial bleeding, which this appears to be, is more likely to break the surface tension and cause all kinds of mess by forming free-floating droplets that will go all over the place. Listen to me, I need your help, okay? I've never done this before. <laughs> That's pretty much exactly what I'd say at the beginning of procedures. I find it instills confidence. So to see what you're doing, you'd need suction and an endoscope, just as Alex uses. However, to contain the mess, the current plan for any surgery in space may involve a sealed glove box. But um, keeping the blood in isn't the main reason, it's keeping the bugs out. Airborne microbes have been recorded in the International Space Station at 10 times the level you would find in an operating theater. And because there's no convection current uh, due to a lack of gravity, hot air doesn't rise, the air doesn't circulate the same way it does on Earth, and you can get uh, colonization of bacteria. Fans can help, but they can also blow the bacteria around. Next, parasites. The illus colonists run into all manner of visual problems caused by parasites, but even without that, spaceflight seriously compromises vision. Spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome is loss of visual function in space that occurs very commonly. But let's think about more exotic eye problems, ocular parasites. Now, not being an exobiologist like uh, Dr. L.V. Okoye, I would not want to speculate on the possible biology of an alien organism, but in the book, early on, L.V. explains that even though humans come from an entirely different biosphere, we haven't co-evolved with life on Illus the way we have on Earth, Humans are still warm, walking reservoirs of fluid and nutrients, so we might still be victim to microorganisms just looking for somewhere nice 
to live. She fairly sensibly suggests total isolation by being sealed in a dome where nothing can get in or out, which is always something that made me laugh about M-class planets on Star Trek. I mean, sure, Mr. Data, the air is breathable, but what about all the fricking bugs that are guaranteed to be in that air? So does something like the ocular parasites exist here on Earth? Unfortunately, yes. Parasitic eye infections, bigger than bacteria, as suggested by LV's pictures, are explained to not directly be attacking sufferers per se, but just getting all up into there with your eye holes as they're a nice place to be. And this is indeed the origin of the word parasite from the Greek meaning eating at someone else's table. Toxoplasmosis, you might know as a disease caught from cats. Many of us will have it at some point, but the only ones who really get a noticeable infection are newborn babies or patients with compromised immune systems like someone suffering from AIDS. It can result in blindness, just like the infection on Illus. Chagas disease, malaria, leishmaniasis, giardia are just some of the other parasites that can affect the eye, but we haven't even got to the really gross stuff yet. If you're the kind of person that requires the auto doc to synthesize anti-nausea drugs, then it's probably best you look away now as I'm going to show some pretty unpleasant pictures. Several types of nematode worms can infect the eye, transmitted by an insect burrowing into the skin and then making their way to the sweet, sweet eye juices to take up residence in the fluid-filled chambers, just like um, in the expanse and causing diseases on Earth like river blindness. Oh, oh, thank God I'm blind. In the book, the parasites live in the vitreous humor, but in the show, they're in front of the iris, but um, I'll allow it. Radiation anti-cancer treatment appears to be protective though. In that first video, I said that the oncocidals are perhaps the most fanciful science fiction, which is a shame, of course, because cancer is such a huge killer right here on Earth today. Radiation is likely to be a huge problem for space travel. A two and a half year mission to Mars is estimated to be the equivalent of 18,000 chest x-rays. So without going into the radiation side of things again, in this season, we learned that the oncocidal drugs can be protective from these green parasites. Infections like the ones we just discussed are treated with anti-wormy drugs like diethylcarbamazine and antimicrobials, now, would these appear in anti-cancer drug regimens? Well, maybe. We don't know what's in those oncocidal syringes, but we do sometimes give prophylactic antibiotics to, uh, alongside chemotherapy. And there is research ongoing at the moment into enlisting the body's own immune system to snuff out cancerous cells before they cause trouble. So we could imagine that there is some immune system booster uh, in the future, which allows sufferers to beat those green blobbies themselves. Now, incidentally, if you see any products advertised online today claiming that they can boost your immune system, that's nonsense. It is quite literally science fiction. Funnily enough, in areas of the world where wormy infections uh, called helminths are endemic, we note quite low rates of immune system disorders like inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma. So unbelievably, research is taking place which deliberately infects sufferers of autoimmune disease with helminths to see if that will help. Lovely stuff. LV gets very excited in the book due to something called convergent evolution, where organisms which have evolved separately reach the same solution to a certain problem. A classic example is wings, insects, Bats, birds, all split off from the tree of life millions of years ago, but yet have striking similarities. This is how the oncocidals ended up killing the bugs because they evolved to use a similar chemical pathway to cancer cells. Another example of convergent evolution is that on most habitable exoplanets, the main source of energy will be the nearest star or stars. Other sources of energy may be things like geothermal energy. We know that's not the case on Illus. So life there will likely have evolved a way to convert light into energy, i.e. photosynthesis. It doesn't use chlorophyll like on Earth, although the microbes are green like uh, Earth plants. And this explains why they make their way to the human eye because after all, that's where light enters the body. 
It's not common to need to sample fluid from within the eye itself. Normally just swabs or scrapings from the surface of the eye are enough, but occasionally it is done. And most importantly, it looks cool on TV. The very concept of how we might interact with alien life is fascinating. All life on Earth evolved from the same origin. So every life form on Earth shares at least some features. For example, all uh, Earth life uses left-handed isomers of amino acids and right-handed isomers of sugars. Molecules that have a left and right-handedness are called chiral. We have no idea if that would be the case on another planet, and hence the settlers on Illus, uh, if they decided they wanted to eat a plant or an animal, they might not even be able to digest it. Uh, and by the same token, our own immune systems might be completely useless against local pathogens. In the book, LV talks about life on Illus being bichiral. The concept of mirror life using molecules of different chirality to us has been explored in sci-fi like Mass Effect or even Through the Looking Glass when Alice goes into Mirror World. So this storyline is just phenomenal on every level. I give it five space lasagnas. Death slugs, well, many creatures on Earth defend themselves with potent neurotoxins, but none that can enter the bloodstream as quickly as the death slugs that I'm aware of. The book explains the slugs are just accidental uh, lethal bastards, not actually using the neurotoxin as a defense mechanism. Regrowth gel. Well, this one is potentially not that far off. Don't get me wrong, we're nowhere near regrowing digits quite yet, but the research is pretty exciting. I know this because I started researching a video on the science behind Deadpool. I never made that video, but I learned all about salamanders like axolotls that are favorites of regenerative medicine researchers as they can regrow entire limbs. What's more funky is if you remove a tail and a leg from an axolotl and swap them around, reattach them, they will convert into the correct appendages. The tail will become a leg and the leg will become a tail, but that's nothing compared to planaria, which can be cut into 279 pieces and each will regrow into a full organism complete with conditioned neurological responses. I don't want to call them memories, but that's how they are sometimes reported. Humans, of course, don't do this, except infants. Babies can actually regrow the tips of their fingers, but please do not attempt to test this out. Mammals, of course, normally form scar tissue instead. The genetic information is there in our cells to make a new limb or finger, but whereas axolotls can switch the right genes back on and make appropriate stem cells and grow a limb, we lose that ability. And research in the field is trying to find out how we might be able to activate those genes. And finally, being spaced. There's no end of dramatic depictions of what would happen to a human in the vacuum of space, and almost all of them get it completely wrong. This is probably the best I've seen, as we have, of course, come to expect from The Expanse. Although I would say the physics are a little bit off here. As the doors open, the air would rush out incredibly quickly, and not only would he feel intense agony as his ears violently popped, but we would not be able to hear David Strathern's dulcet tones almost immediately rather than gradually fading out. But hey, this is the end of the series, and my feeling is that science should never get in the way of drama and storytelling, so this is much more poignant. Anyway, that to one side. Cold, when you're in space, is not really the issue. There's no air to conduct or convect heat away from your skin, but don't hold your breath because when the doors open, the air would expand inside your lungs, just like coming up from a very deep dive with a lung full of air, uh, which can be fatal. You see telangiectasia and petechiae forming all over Ashford's skin and eyes. These are dilated and burst blood vessels. Gases in the superficial tissues and blood vessels would boil and there would be significant tissue damage. This is called ebullism, the formation of bubbles beneath the skin. When the legendary Joseph Kittinger famously jumped from the edge of space in 1960, his right glove tore and he developed ebullism localized to his right hand, swelling to twice the size of his left. It made a full recovery though. Three Soviet astronauts died due to decompression in space. But amazingly, this also happened to someone who survived, not in space, but in a vacuum chamber here on Earth when a pressure hose came loose. I heard over the headset that he was losing suit pressure. We have, uh, 
The tube pressurizing his suit had become disconnected. He was in serious danger. There really wasn't any feeling. It was just happening so fast, you know, trying to get the chamber back to a safe pressure and Jim to a safe pressure. It was inside the suit. As I stumbled backwards, I could feel the saliva on my tongue starting to bubble just before I went unconscious. Current belief is that a human would be able to recover without disastrous injury if exposed to the vacuum of space for less than about 90 seconds, something that we see right in the first series. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately the channel's taking a bit of a backseat temporarily. I had hoped to get this out at the end of last year, so forgive me this little retrospective, but 2019 was a big year for the channel. I started on just under 7,000 subs, I ended on around 150,000, and I've got all of you to thank for that. Well, and Tom Scott. It was the year I got insanely lucky to have joined a group of amazing educational creators like Real Engineering, Wendover, Tierzu, Thomas Frank, Cinema Wins, CGP Grey, Kuz Gazak, and loads more. We started up Nebula, a new streaming service without the YouTube algorithmic sword of Damocles hanging over us, but not a day goes by that I'm not crippled by imposter syndrome around these subscriber millionaires. So viewers, will you help me? Crush them. Yes, if I can throw superior sign-up figures for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle in their stupid, successful, handsome faces, then perhaps they'll stop making me eat on the floor. There are literally thousands of good reasons to sign up for this honestly fantastic deal that will benefit you directly, but spite, competitiveness, and insecurity have always been my main motivators in life, so perhaps you think the same way. This is also the first year I got sponsors, and CuriosityStream have supported me more than any other, from my very first sponsored video about transfusing young blood into old people, to one about medical torture, right through to this one about eye parasites. So they probably think I'm some sort of twisted weirdo, but I don't even mind, because they're awesome. They have thousands of high quality, vetted documentaries which you can access for only $2.99 a month. If you're a space fan, you're spoiled for choice. You can learn about exoplanets like Illus, except they're real. But my pick has got to be Destination Moon, a series exploring how we could colonize Luna, our first step into the world of the expanse. And not only have Curiosity Stream supported me, but they're offering you a completely free subscription to Nebula, where you'll find all your favorite educational creators for no additional cost. War, ha, huh. what is it good for? Well, not being recommended by the YouTube algorithm, that's what. So videos like my Holocaust one or Real Engineering's Nebula original series on the logistics of D-Day can be made thanks to Nebula acting as a platform that's run by us, not a corporate overlord. There are no pre-roll ads, and most importantly, no punitive algorithm stopping us from tackling certain topics. So to enjoy not only everything CuriosityStream has to offer, as well as access to all these educational creators' playground of new ideas, sign up at the link below and use the promo code MEDLIFE to get a month free. If you decide to continue after that, it's only $2.99 a month. I'm always humbled by how many of you ask if I have a Patreon. But instead, sign up for this offer, and you get something out of it instead of giving me money directly that I'll just spend go in Bobo Rome for OPA.